All right. Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, this is the last one for today. So my um, capstone actually shifts quite a lot from all the last few that you've seen and is far more clinical based. So I really enjoy more the clinical aspect of biology and medicine, and so my capstone definitely is centered on that. So I looked into various aspects of medicine in resource limited settings. And um, my first part I did in the summer and fall of 2021, and I'm not gonna touch on that much, but then the second part of it um, I completed in this, this semester, spring of 2022. So the part one I presented on at the, I think at the beginning of last year, I believe I presented on this part one, but I completed this at the Women's Christian Hospital in Maltan, Pakistan. So it was on-field experience and research and that I did once I came back. So I interned under Dr. Michelle White, who you see, or Dr. Michelle Walsh, who you see here, and she um, allowed me just to kind of shadow her and work in the hospital with her. So I spent a month there, and then when I came back, I did a lot of research on these four different things, skid, phenylketonuria, urea cycle disorders, and cleft lip and palate, which we saw a lot of at the hospital. And so some of the research was for her, some of it was just for myself um, to just try to learn more about some things that we saw um, a lot of. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And then the second part, which I'm gonna talk a lot more about today, was working, as um, Dr. Bennett said, with the Rohingya Refugee Clinic. I worked with Bethany Burkholder, who's a nurse practitioner. And this is in the Cox's Bazaar region of, region of Bangladesh, and I did some research and development for the clinic there. So it's in the Kutabalong Balukali refugee camp, and it's mainly Rohingya refugees coming out of Myanmar. And the Salt Health Post is one of a few clinics working in the refugee camp, and they have very limited resources. They just, they don't have a lot of access to medical aid and medical care. They don't have a lot of access to different resources, and so they're doing what they can with pretty limited resources, which creates a little bit of a problem for them because um, the practitioners working at the clinic have all been trained to a higher level than what they actually have available to use at the clinic. And so what happens then is that there's just kind of a scattering of different treatments for different patients, um, depending what the practitioner wants to do because they're so far below what everybody's really been trained to. So she was hoping to kind of develop something that's very streamlined that everybody's doing so that if patients come in, they're getting the same treatment per practitioner that they see. So that was mainly what I did. Um, she gave me a list of a bunch of different areas that she said they had pretty limited resources on, far below what the actual standard of care is. And I chose three of them. I chose burn care um, with limited resources, and then also neonatal nutrition with limited resources, especially when breastfeeding is not an option. And then also management of a goiter um, when thyroidectomy is not an option. So I did the, each of these, I did three different aspects of it. I researched and compiled pretty much all of the current research on these um, different topics. And then guided by the resources that the clinic actually has available to them, I created a best practice and put it into like a guideline for them to use just practically for use in the clinic in their day to day. I collaborated a lot with Bethany. I was back and forth with her frequently. And then Dr. White and Dr. Bennett also both advised on it um, as I went through it. So the first one on burn care, I'm just gonna kind of walk you through I'm not going to nearly go into all of the stuff that I have, but just kind of walk you through what it looked like and what I actually did. So for burn care, it was definitely the most expansive of the three. I looked into topical antibiotics, oral antibiotics, dressing practices, um, blister care, pain control, positioning, tetanus, rehydration, supplements and nutrition, and then paritis. So I took each one of these and then took it through those three bullet points that I talked about previously. So this slide is text heavy, but I'm gonna just talk through it a little bit. I just want to give you kind of an overview of what we did, and um, if you can't see in the back really well, I apologize, but I just took three of these from the list I had previously and um, condensed them down onto this slide for you. So the first one, topical treatments, basically I asked her, what do you have available for topical treatments? And they have FSD cream, um, mucorosin cream, and topical antifungals, that's about it. So then I looked at all the research that's out there for um, topical treatments and then based a, gave her a recommended protocol. So my recommendation was using FSD as the main treatment, which is used quite a lot actually, even in, even in developed countries. And then mucorosin cream is used for suspected MRSA. So then I went into the different things that you'll see with MRSA and how you tell that from other things, from other infections. 
and if they suspect MRSA, this is how they should treat it. And then also looking at fungal infections, and again, if you see these different signs, this is probably a fungal infection and this is how you should treat it. And then going on to dressings, again, just looking at the things they have available, they basically have gauze and gauze bandage rolls and different ointments, which is far, far below the standard of burn care in developed countries where there's numerous different dressings developed and there's gels and there's all these different things that they use now for burns that the clinic just has no access to. So I actually, for this section specifically, kind of went back to older research um, where they didn't have quite as much of the dressings that we have now and based the protocol off of those. So the biggest thing is just keeping the wound clean. So whatever dressings you have available to just keep the wound really clean and then keeping it moist at all times. So using Vaseline with different moisture or with different creams that you're using to, um, to make, try to keep the wound as moist as you possibly can. And then I get, talked about thickness of dressings, how many dressings they should be putting on and how frequently they should be doing dressing changes and just took everything that we have currently and compiled it and condensed it into a protocol for them. Another one was pain management. Um, the options that she originally told, originally told me that they had available was Tylenol, ibuprofen, and naproxen. And these are over-the-counter medications. They are not narcotics. They are not strong. And like for burns, burns are incredibly painful. And the general treatment for burns is narcotics because it's so painful, especially when they have to do dressing changes, which is the most painful portion. So that's all they had. So I looked into all the research out there and obviously a lot of it was based off of far stronger um, pain management, but found some guidelines for using this and basically dosing it frequently and mixing different types of medications that you can dose for frequently. One thing that came up often was using benzodiazepines for, for dressing changes because they have some amnesic effects. And so dosing them with benzodiazepines like half an hour or so before a dressing change and then doing a dressing change. And so I asked her if there's any possibility they can access them because they're not as controlled substance as like narcotics. And she looked into it and found that they are actually able to access lorazepam and midazolam, um, which she hadn't even realized that they had access to. So she said, if I'm able to get them to the clinic, will you write a protocol for their use for us? So I said, absolutely. So I um, looked into using both of these medications in doing specifically with dressing changes, but then also combining them with these medications that are so, um, that are not very strong like Tylenol and ibuprofen. And basically wrote up a protocol for doing dressing changes and using these medications. The other aspect of, burn, of pain management I looked into was just um, non-pharmacological management of pain. So methods that they can use for managing pain. And this is especially like for kids and dressing changes, like techniques of distraction and um, really talking through it up front and taking breaks and taking it slow and really soaking the dressings before you try to take them off and things like that to just give like some practical things that they can do when you just have no way around that it's just gonna be a painful process. I also address just the psychological effects of pain and how they can just be aware of what effects this is going to have on their patients and trying to um, mitigate that as much as possible by just front loading patients and talking through it with them. So that was kind of what the burn, I took, I took all those, that whole list of things and did this with pretty much every single one of them. Um, made a pretty long um, compilation of everything that was there and then condensed it down into a guideline for them to use as well. I'll talk just briefly getting into more nitty gritty about silver sulfadiazine. Obviously that came up a lot and that's a huge burn treatment um, that I read about so many times and so I just spent more time digging into that to really understand it. This is its chemical structure here and there's kind of a lot going on in this slide but basically um, it works for, it's antimicrobial and the way they think it works and some of, the, some of this they know, some of this is speculation. It, um, they think it intercalates with DNA and causes DNA denaturation. denaturation. And then um, it also works on proteins to cause structural changes in bacterial cell wall. It works on enzymes. Um, it also releases potassium and does hydrogen bonding. And all of these kind of lead to an efflux of metabolites. It disrupts the respiratory chain, increases free radicals, inhibits cell signaling, inhibits protein synthesis. Basically all these things that a bacteria needs to survive it kind of attacks them and that's why it works so well in burn wounds to just kind of break down bacteria. It also is suspected that it, er, they're pretty sure that it inhibits healing to some extent, but when you have either um, the possibility of the wound taking longer to heal or the patient dying from infection, 
you're going to use it. Like it's a, it's the best option that's there. So that's the burn portion. That's definitely what I spent the meat of my time on probably and just dug into the most. Um, secondly was the neonatal nutrition. This portion, um, she had three big things that she was hoping for more research on. Um, so nutrition alternatives to breastfeeding for infants under six months of age, and then boosting breast milk production and also looking into domperidone and metoclopramide, and then inducing lactation in adoptive mothers. So um, actually, I'll go back to that again briefly. They have they have very a lot of difficulty accessing um, formula. It's not a very great option. And so once infants reach six months of age, there's other nutrition options for them aside from formula and breast milk. But under six months of age, you really can't give an infant anything aside from formula or breast milk. And so she said, just do you know of anything? Like look into seeing if there's any other things that they can use um, because it's just so difficult to get formula and they're not allowed to give formula out. So that was what I spent a lot of time on. Again, this is just kind of my big guidelines condensed down. So I'll just walk through them a little bit. The nutrition alternatives to breastfeeding um, for infants under six months of age. Basically, the biggest thing that I found is just really, really actually prioritizing breastfeeding. So sometimes the actual patient saying that they can't um, breastfeed their infants is not a problem actually, but it's just a lack of education. And so the biggest thing to help this age is to really push education for breastfeeding. So this can be prenatal and postnatally and nutrition for the mother and infant and just a variety of different things that the clinic should be implementing to try to increase their um, rates of breastfeeding. Other than that then, there's donor human milk and then um, she gave me a list of all of the supplements that they have available and I compared them to recommended supplements for malnourished infants and kind of up with a protocol. So big ones are infant zinc supplements and vitamin A supplementation are big for infants. Um, that they find lacking in malnourished infants. And so just the dosings for that, for that, if they have an infant come into the clinic that's really malnourished. For boosting breast milk production then, um, the recommended protocol that I gave them was just a lot of coaching on breastfeeding, techniques to actually assess what um, amount of milk that infant's actually getting and to see if there is a problem or not. And then just manually expressing and also talking through like proper attachment of the infant to the breast, and then also natural galactagogues, so different things that people suspect actually help boost. There's not a lot of this that's really um, proven, but suspect help to boost breast milk and production, basically just throwing out anything available to try to help as much as possible. The third thing is stimulating lactation in adoptive mothers. So if a mother dies or can't breastfeed her baby, they'll try to have somebody else help with it. And there's a whole protocol actually for inducing lactation in a mother who has not given birth. That's in, I put it into the, into the paper itself and I won't go much in depth with that, but I'll talk about domperidone a little bit later on. But then natural galactagogues, as I talked about before, um, breastfeeding frequently, don't, don't use a bottle, um, and just a lot of encouragement and support for the mother. So again, my guideline is much more in depth and longer than this, but this is a snapshot of some of the things out of the neonatal nutrition. For domperidone and metoclopramide, she wondered if I would look into the off-label use of them. So they are actually medications for GI use. They are not for lactation, but they have been found to have lactation effects. So domperidone is a, um, actually I'll go to this diagram first here briefly. I keep pulling my mouse to the wrong side. Um, the hypothalamus releases TRH, which works on the anterior pituitary to release prolactin, and prolactin works on the breast and other tissues. If you have a lot of prolactin, it actually stimulates dopamine. Yeah. It actually stimulates dopamine, which will block the effects of releasing prolactin, which will block the release of prolactin. So what dop domperidone does is it's a dopamine receptor antagonist, so it blocks the receptors on the anterior <coughs> pituitary to block dopamine from working while metoclopramide actually blocks the release of dopamine. So they work very similarly. And um, the biggest risk that came up in my research was that, sorry, the biggest risk that came up is the risk of prolonged QTC interval, which is a cardiac effect. And so um, it's not a huge, they don't really think it's a big problem for young lactating mothers, but it is something to be aware of. So I just recommended that they do a lot of screening or if they're gonna, if they're gonna give it, that they screen for cardiac. Um, history, so if they have any history of having any cardiac disease or family cardiac history, which a lot of these patients 
have never seen a doctor before. And so that's difficult in and of itself. But it still remains a fairly low risk. And so I recommended that they do use it um, and that it should be fine for use. And there is quite a few different places that use them. Domperidone actually works best to stimulate lactation, whereas metoclopramide is more useful when their daily milk supply is decreasing. It can help increase it. So I dug into those two quite a bit um, for her as well. One really exciting part of it um, was a networking um, possibility that I had. And so through a connection from Dr. Bennett, I was able to connect with Dr. Tamid Ahmed, who is the executive director of the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. And this is in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and it's one of the biggest research centers for maternal and fetal health in um, Asia. And he is the head of their research on maternal and childhood malnutrition. So it was a perfect connection, and I emailed back and forth with him quite a bit, and he did confirm that there just is not a lot of options for that zero to six month period. But he said the best thing possible is to really, really push a lot of breastfeeding education. That's the biggest thing that they've seen to help. So he connected me with the hospital. They have this ICDDRB has a hospital that they work with that has a lactation consulting um, portion. And he connected me with this lactation consultant who I connected with Bethany. And they were quite intrigued with what the clinic is doing and might do some work together there to do have a lactation consultant either come help at the clinic or do some training at the clinic for their staff. So that was a really fun connection that I made and I enjoyed talking with him about it. The third um, portion was goiter care. This one was definitely smaller, mostly because there just isn't a lot to do, honestly, for goiter care. But I looked into types of goiter, causes, diagnosis, and treatment. As you can see, each of these women have a large neck goiter or thyroid goiter. So her question, her big question was what is an options for management of goiter when thyroidectomy is not a pro option, so either they can't pay for it or they just can't access it. But secondly, it might not be an option because if you have a thyroidectomy, you must be on hormones then from there on forward. And so um, if these patients have a risk of not being able to access hormones after a thyroidectomy, you don't really want to do a thyroidectomy. And these, all these patients are highly at risk to not be able to access hormones later on. So thyroidectomy just really isn't a great option for them. So the two treatments basically are levothyroxine and carbimazole. And there's different types of goiter. So there's euthyroid diffuse goiter, there's a nodular goiter, and then there's a goiter due to hypothyroidism and a goiter due to hyperthyroidism, and then also retrosternal goiter. And so I looked into each one of these and basically the treatments of them. And they're basic, there's not a lot to them. Levothyroxine, in general, can help shrink the goiter down, um, but as soon as they go off levothyroxine, the goiter is probably going to grow again. So there just isn't a lot of options, unfortunately, but it was really interesting to look into. I also just looked into, yeah, the causes of it and, um, uh, oh, now I'm forgetting the word, zinc, zinc, no, it's not zinc. There's a deficiency that is often seen that causes these goiters. And, um, but it's not, it is not a thing in Bangladesh because they, um, iodine, thank you, iodine deficiency, wow, is often a cause of goiters, but not usually in coastal countries because they eat a lot of fish and this population eats a lot of fish. So iodine deficiencies is not the problem. Um, it can be genetic, there can be other causes. And they do, she said she thinks they see it more than you, she's seen in other places. So there is likely some environmental or um, genetic factor in the goiter, but not really anything that they've pinpointed and not really anything that they can probably do um, about. So this one was just interesting. And um, I did, the big thing I did was definitely talking through TSH and T4 levels. They can test for this, but they don't actually do it very frequently. So just suggesting that they start early testing of TSH and T4 for suspe suspected patients with hypo or hyperthyroidism, because if they start treating these things earlier on, it can actually, um, it can actually stop the chances of them developing a goiter. And so um, I gave them a protocol for just these levels and what you wanna look at for those. So feedback from her, I was very encouraged by her feedback. She found it really helpful and was really excited to use this. Um, she has some other people she would like to pass some of this information on to. And um, the, other, the other exciting part of it is that I sent the neonatal nutrition portion to the doctor in Pakistan and that hospital is a um, that hospital is an OBGYN hospital, 
and she was excited about the information and wondered if there would be any interest in coming back to Pakistan and setting up some type of lactation or um, breastfeeding um, focus for the staff there. So I don't know that I will, but I may pass it on to somebody else who needs a capstone um, project to do. Lastly, a big thank you to Dr. Bennett, who looked over a lot of my information and just fact-checked it and looked through sources and things like that. And then also Dr. White was my clinical advisor, I would say, for this. And from her clinical experience and also with her master's in public health, she definitely was able to give a lot of feedback and input into the stuff that I was suggesting and giving. And then lastly to Bethany, I had many, many emails going back and forth with Bethany, and she promptly answered pretty much all of them. And I had a lot of questions that she took and answered and sent back again. And so I really enjoyed working for her and with her, and I just hope that somehow this project helps her work be a little bit easier. Um, but it was a great honor to work with her, and I really enjoyed it. Lastly, I would just say there's the guidelines that I put on here. I didn't source because they have multitudes of sources. And so if you're interested in reading more or seeing my sources, I will happily send you my paper. But I didn't put all the sources on these slides. Thank you very much. That's all.